Pink family. This is Brooke Hodge, your Director of Health Services, and today I have with me Elise Piscitelli, who is our Director of Nursing um, at Asbury, and we wanted to take this opportunity to um, film this recording for those who were unable to join us for the in-person um, in-services that we did last week and be able to get the information to you guys um, so that you would be aware of Aldersgate's processes, um, kind of a background of COVID, and also um, have the opportunity to present you guys with questions that your teammates have asked, and we wanted to share those same questions with you um, with the answers so that you would be um, equally as informed. So today, um, we are going to talk about COVID-19, which is the topic that none of us can escape um, if you turn on your television, your car, um, your cell phone, we are just being inundated and flooded with COVID. And so why is COVID important? Why is this um, new virus strain that has really taken over the United States and globally, why is it of, of importance to us um, here at Aldersgate? So I wanna take a step back and first talk about um, what is the coronavirus? What is COVID-19? Why is it everywhere? Why is it, um, you know, on every media outlet? Um, you can't look at your cell phone, Facebook, all other forms of social media without seeing the coronavirus. And what made this particular virus um, so important and so noteworthy? When we posed this question um, to the group, um, kind of the um, overall consensus was it's so important because it's, it's killing a lot of people. And, and that is true, it is killing a lot of people, but in fairness, there are lots of things that kill um, a lot of people that have not gotten the attention that COVID-19 has. Um, we had um, H1N1 back in 2009 um, that frankly, it um, killed over 200,000 people and infected um, around 30 million people worldwide. Um, but yet it didn't receive the same amount of attention that COVID-19 has. So what makes it so popular? COVID-19, it is the coronavirus. And um, the reason that it's called COVID-19 is because it is the coronavirus and that is where you get the CO from. The um, VI is for virus and the D stands for disease, and the 19 stands for when the particular strain was first identified, which was at the very end of 2019. And what makes this virus so newsworthy and so different from others is frankly how it came about. With the coronavirus, and it in itself, this particular um, family of viruses, is not anything new to healthcare. Coronavirus has been around for um, I think it was first identified in the 1960s. So we've got you know, many years that we have um, battled and the human body has fought um, the coronavirus. But what makes this particular strain so different and so um, intriguing and the fact that it's been able to cause so um, quickly um, infections throughout um, the US and frankly on a global level is really just how this particular strain came about. Um, most infections can happen from human to human. That's nothing new. Um, we, if I had something, I could easily um, affect Elise with something that I had if it was contagious. Um, it's also nothing new for an animal to infect a human. If I were to go out on a nice hike on a beautiful day and I were to actually get a tick on me, what's something that I could get from that animal? I could get Lyme disease. Um, so having an animal to human transmission is nothing new. However, if I get Lyme disease, I myself would have Lyme disease. I wouldn't be able to give that Lyme disease over to a lease. So therefore, animal to human and then human to human doesn't typically happen really quickly. It usually takes some time for that level of evolution to occur. And what was so unique about this coronavirus is how it really came about. So how did it come about? And the answer is that we know that the first cases were identified over in a small province of China that was very densely populated um, of the Wuhan province. 
And so, um, and we know that there is um, kind of theory that it started in this, um, you know, kind of seafood market. And over a short amount of time, there were lots of people in this province that were presenting with kind of these unique uh, pneumonia-like symptoms um, that really were baffling to um, doctors and scientists. And as they drilled down to it, um, they were able to identify that it was a strain of coronavirus um, that has gotten the name COVID-19 since then. Um, and around the time that they were identifying all of these cases of um, the, these pneumonia-like symptoms in the Wuhan province, um, the Chinese government did alert the um, World Health Organization, which is abbreviated WHO, the WHO, and they uh, kind of alerted them that they were seeing all these cases, lots of them, in this Chinese province. And so, again, having lots of people infected with, some, with something is nothing new. We've had the HIV AIDS epidemic that's been ongoing since 1981. Every year we have, you know, we battle with um, flu um, epidemics. But again, what made this so unique was the fact that they were able to identify that the virus came from an animal to a human. Again, nothing new. But what was so intriguing with this is how quickly within the human it was able to mutate and then quickly pass on from human to human to human. And how quickly um, you know, thousands of people were able to become infected with this disease. So fast forward to present day and we can see that since really kind of the November, December timeframe, how it, it has affected us on such a global level um, with the number of cases. So we currently have um, statistics as of today, which today we're filming on April 14th, 2020, is that there are over 1.9 million confirmed cases on a global level. Um, for the United States, um, there have been a little over 582,000 confirmed cases in the United States. Um, total deaths, 120,000 um, worldwide, with 21,662 of those being in the U.S. If we drill it down even more specific, because a lot of times we tend to become very concerned when things start kind of closing in on our own personal bubbles. And if you look at North Carolina, we um, currently have um, over 4,800 confirmed cases of COVID-19. 86 deaths um, statewide. Um, currently, there are over 313 people in the hospital with a COVID-related diagnosis. And in Mecklenburg County alone, we are at a total of about 993 confirmed cases with um, 14 deaths for our county. So you can see how it started in China and how it made its way over into, you know, really our, our own personal bubble. So how did it get here? How did it get here from China? And so the answer is, as you guys know from a lot of our screening questions, kind of early on was looking at really that travel component. People that were going over to China as really a business hub and coming back to the United States um, or frankly, they were coming back to, you know, another country and then we were having, you know, Americans go on vacation to these countries and that's how the exposure came about. Um, so that's how it was quickly able to spread on a global level um, and the, the quickness of it is what really, you know, kind of attracted the attention of doctors, scientists, the media, frankly, um, for us. Um, Mortality rate worldwide um, is around about 4%. So that means 4% of folks that get it um, will likely it will result in death. I wanna caution everybody that these numbers that I have um, given to everybody, you have to really take them in context because the only folks that we know that are positive are frankly those that are getting tested for COVID-19. And as you guys know, the availability of testing for this virus is very limited, even um, as long as we've been battling this now. And we really put, you know, um, this became kind of on our radar, kind of the middle of February, end of February um, for us here, at, you know, at Aldersgate. 
and you can see that, you know, looking now a month and a half into it, almost two months, um, that testing is not really that much more available um, than it was, you know, months ago. Um, they're really reserving tests for people that are symptomatic, and we know through um, kind of the cases and observations that there can be people that um, may not show symptoms. So we've got people that could potentially be walking around that um, could have the virus that we don't know about. So the numbers are not always going to be accurate. You have to be tested to be able to be confirmed as having COVID-19. So we probably have seen deaths um, at a local, state, national, and global level that are not going to be um, counted as a COVID-related death if, frankly, they were never tested. So that kind of gives you a background of how the coronavirus came about, how did it come to the U.S., and uh, what, are, what are we doing about it? What is the U.S. doing about it? And more importantly, what is Aldersgate doing about it um, to be able to protect our residents and our team members um, from keeping this virus um, out of our community? And thus far to date, we do have zero confirmed cases in our community, which is really incredible when you look at um, you know, surrounding counties, really even within our county, um, outbreaks that are occurring at other nursing facilities, other continuing care retirement communities, because you can see that that has not been the case um, for, for everyone. We've been very blessed here at Aldersgate to have weeks to be able to prepare um, for what may come, and I, I say may because we hope that, um, that it won't come, but um, if it does, we are ready to to fight back with our plan. So our plan that we have been really um, tackling and, and our plan has included, you know, round table discussions with, with everyone, looking at, you know, having the social workers, life enrichment, um, our medical director, nursing, culinary, housekeeping, um, really just having all those players um, around the table to, to look at the plan look at where do we have holes, where are there opportunities that we really need to drill in, and that's how our plan um, here at Aldersgate has come about. We had a plan very early on when we had very um, low risk, or frankly no risk at all, and what did we do at that time? That was really early on restricting our visitation um, to our community. It was not a popular decision, obviously, with um, a lot of our residents and our family members, because that is hard um, to make that decision that you're not going to be able to physically see your loved one. And that's um, hard for people, especially those that, you know, come every single day to see their, their family member. Um, but knowing that the greatest risk um, to our elders was going to be coming from the outside um, in. So we made that decision very early on. Um, we also started doing away with communal dining, um, delivering meals to our independent living residents so that they would stay in their space, not having you know, dining rooms open in our healthcare areas so that folks weren't um, you know, close together during dining. So these were kind of the you know, early things that we did. We started doing huddles um, with our, our team members to really look at every single aspect of, of things and have those daily discussions with each other of um, what we need to do. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, what Aldersgate's plan is and what you can do to um, really protect yourself and your residents and frankly your family members and other loved ones that you come home to um, when, you, when you finish work. So um, before I turn it over to Elise to kind of talk about um, some of those things that you can do to protect yourself, I want to talk for just a few minutes about some of the myths that you may have heard, um, frankly, from maybe your peers and maybe from your family members. And really a large source of where we get a lot of myths from is from the media. Um, who are not um, giving always you know, factual information. A lot of times information is given for the shock factor of it. And so we want to make sure that you have the um, most up-to-date and accurate information. I'm confident, as is Elise and Suzanne, our CEO, and Jeff, our Chief Operating Officer, as well as Kathleen, our Director of Human Resources, that the information that we're giving you guys is not only accurate, but it is the most up-to-date information. Every single day, we are on calls with the Center for Disease Control. 
We were on calls with that um, organization that I told you about at the very beginning, the World Health Organization. Our Department of Health and Human Services, who comes in yearly to regulate Asbury, our skilled nursing building, as well as our assisted living and memory care, um, we're on calls with them every single day, as well as our local and state health department. So we're, and also with other um, large organizational bodies, such as Leading Age, and the North Carolina Healthcare Facility Association. So we are getting lots of information from multiple sources to be able to make sure that the decisions that we make here at Aldersgate are the best decisions and ones that are going to protect us to the best of our ability and knowing how to do so. Um, will we keep this virus out of our community? I would love to say yes, um, but knowing that that may not always happen, and so knowing that we need to be prepared be prepared um, if that's not the case. So talking about a couple of myths that you may have heard, um, some of the myths that um, we've heard are that this virus is airborne, it's meaning that if something is airborne, that means that if I were to cough or I were to sneeze, my droplets from my saliva or my sneeze would linger in the air for up to three hours. So that if Elise wasn't even in this room with me and I sneezed, and if this virus was truly airborne and she came in an hour later, she could potentially catch the virus if it was airborne. That is not the case with the coronavirus. It is not airborne. Now, you may say, but wait a minute, why, are we, why were we mandated, you know, um, you know last week to wear um, facial um, coverings or, you know, surgical masks if we're in a healthcare area if it's not airborne? And I'll tell you why. If you are maintaining that social distance that's been recommended, and you've heard it so many times, of that six feet of distance um, between you and someone else, which I know we're, we're close here for the sake of filming, but that six feet is the distance that you need to safely maintain your distance with someone. And that would actually not even require you to wear a facial covering um, because this disease is not airborne, it's droplet. So if we are six feet apart from each other, the likelihood that she is gonna get this virus from me, is it's, it's not gonna happen because this virus does not linger in the air, the likelihood that something coming out of my mouth, a sneeze, a cough, saliva, is going to get within her for six feet is highly unlikely. The reason this virus has become so contagious is because the second component of it, there's also a contact component to this virus, meaning if I sneeze into my hands and then I touch something or I touch this paper and then a leaf comes behind and she touches it if I was infected, and then she then touches her eyes or her mouth, she could get the COVID-19 um, if that was the case. So the reason we're seeing so many infections is not so much because we're close and I'm sneezing on her, because that just doesn't happen, you know, in your day to day, unless you have children, you're probably not getting, you know, snotted on or sneezed on um, on a regular basis. It's more likely that I am not washing my hands, which is the best thing you can do, which at least we'll talk about, it's not so much the sneezing and coughing in that close proximity, it's that contact. Me touching things, someone else not washing their hands, and then you're getting some portal injury, mouth, nostril, eyes, ears, um, opening in your skin, and that's more likely how people are getting this virus. It's not from the um, being in the air component of it. So that's one myth that I wanted to dispel. People have put a lot of, um, you know, credibility and credence into, oh, I have to have a mask to be protected from, from this virus. And really and truly, it's the hand washing that's gonna protect you from this virus. It's not the facial coverings, which at least we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, another um, piece of this is, um, you know, the age piece of it that, frankly, if, you know, I am not elderly, um, I don't have to worry about this, you know, disease killing me. And I will tell you that that is grossly untrue. This virus is affecting all ages. We've seen um, babies that have passed away from this virus all the way up to the elderly. So it is affecting everybody equally. It's also affecting men versus women equally. Um, it's been very interesting that um, 
you know, we were expecting that for the elder population, it to really hit them the worst. And that's frankly not been the case. Um, with the elder population, the likelihood of mortality, meaning the likelihood that they will die, is far greater than, say, someone who's 20 that contracts the virus. But the contraction, as we have seen, that it has been really the highest in kind of that, you know, late 20, early 30s to mid 50 age group um, that we're seeing. Novant, um, and I haven't seen what their ICU looks like for this week, but as of last week, the majority of the folks in their ICU related to COVID that are on respirators have been men that have been kind of in that 40 to 50 age group. So to think that it's only affecting, um, a, you know, a, a negative um, impact on our elderly is just not true. Everybody needs to be aware of this virus and what you can do to protect yourselves. Um, with our elders though, it is far likely um, more common for it to be fatal for them just because with aging, your immune system um, naturally tends to just go downhill with aging. Um, so, and then also with aging, you're far more likely to have other comorbidities. And what a comorbidity may mean is that they may have heart disease, they could have COPD, um, they could have renal disease. So having those comorbidities on top of being um, an, you know, elderly is um, really predisposing them to a higher mortality rate than you know, the fairly healthy 30-year-old you know, that may get the virus. Um, so I wanted to put that myth out there as far as age. Um, also, when it comes to um, kind of racial um, myths that have been out there, we had a lot of team members who were expressing that they had heard that if you were African American, that you were far more likely um, to not contract COVID-19 and that you were far better protected than people who were not African American. And I'll tell you why that, um, that myth kind of came about is because early on, um, there is a huge map um, that John Hopkins puts out um, and they updated every hour and it would show you, um, it had the whole um, you know, world on this map and it would show you kind of the hot areas of where um, a lot of cases were creeping up and kind of early on, you would see China was really lit up red and you would see that um, Italy was really lit up red with what they were going through. And then obviously the United States was really lit up red. And so the continent of Africa, for, um, for a little bit of time um, was not showing the same um, hotspot areas as other places. And so um, folks were incorrectly thinking, hmm, okay, so uh, it looks like there may be a level of protection um, for Africa. And that is just not the case. The reason that the, we are seeing lesser cases in um, Africa, and frankly, even in the United States with um, African Americans, was the fact that health disparities still exist. COVID-19 did not take that away. And it is a very unfortunate um, reality of healthcare that um, the access to healthcare for someone that is African-American is frankly, it's not the same as someone who is Caucasian. And so um, there have been studies that have been done that have shown that um, for Caucasians and frankly, other um, you know, racial groups, the testing has been done far more prominently than with African Americans. And so if you're again, kind of back to my earlier point, if you're not testing someone and showing a positive, then you can't capture that as a positive. So it's not saying that the African American population were not um, getting COVID-19. It was just that access to healthcare and the availability of testing being done on them that just wasn't happening. So know that all races are equally affected and predisposed to this virus. It really just comes down to that access to healthcare um, that, that we were seeing um, with this. Um, the final myth that I just wanna to touch um, on is that if we can just get to the warmer months, COVID-19 um, will, will go away, kind of like with the flu. You know, once we, once we start seeing, you know, April, we're like, oh, great, we're out of flu season. We don't know that for a fact right now. It is, um, you can see that Florida, which is warm pretty much year round, has been hit really hard, um, you know, with this virus. And it is not, the virus is not paying attention to heat and, uh, you know, slowing down cases. 
So um, we don't know if warmer months are going to um, you know, be in our favor. Time will tell as we learn about this virus. Um, I think that a huge component of it is that social you know, distancing is the most important thing you can do. And typically in warmer months, we're outside more, we're not cooped up. And so being outside, um, we typically are you know, more spaced out when we're you know, doing sports and things of that nature. Um, so that's typically why we see a decrease in um, you know, infection rates um, when it's in the, the warmer months. Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Elise for her to talk about um, what should you do day to day to really protect yourself um, from this virus, what is going to help lessen your risk of, of getting COVID-19, and um, what should you do if, frankly, someone starts to show respiratory symptoms. So I'm going to turn it over to Elise now. Thank you. So um, like Brooke mentioned, the two uh, main things that we can do um, to prevent the spread of any infection is uh, hand washing and also surface de uh, disinfection or decontamination of the surface. So as Brooke shared, um, what we do know about the coronavirus is the route of transmission, which means how um, can we contract that virus? How does it spread? Um, so one of the big myths that Brooke had mentioned was that uh, the virus is airborne. That has not been proven by the World Health Organization, um, the CDC. The route of transmission for coronavirus is considered to be droplet in contact. So for something to be airborne, we would need those droplets, those molecules of that virus would need to be a certain size for it to project um, a further distance in the air. And that is typically about the six feet, which is why they say the social distance six feet apart. Um, so for coronavirus, the droplets are too large, um, so they will not suspend in the air for a long amount of time, which means that you have to be within close proximity to someone that would sneeze or cough for those droplets um, to possibly come into contact with yourself or for you to um, inhale them so that way um, you then you could possibly contract the disease. So the number one way that we prevent the spread of infection um, is through hand washing. We all know that we should be washing our hands for a minimum of 20 seconds and when you are washing your hands you want to have your fingertips pointing down. Um, you are going to make sure you have enough soap on your hands to lather all surfaces and you're going to start with palm to palm uh, making sure you're getting a good lather with the soap, and then you're going to interlock your hands, um, doing the outsides of your hands on both sides. Then keeping your fingers interlocked, you're going to go back to palm to palm and then do your thumbs as well. Your fingertips against the opposing palm and the outsides of your fingers, uh, of your hands as well, against the opposing palm. And then again, palm to palm to finish up. You're not going to shut the sink off with your hand. With your hands, you're going to make sure you grab a paper towel, dry your hands thoroughly, and then shut the sink off. You want to make sure that you're hand washing um, all the time when your hands are visibly soiled, or anytime you have the opportunity for soap and water. Especially for our folks that are in the clinical areas, making sure that you're doing hand washing before you're entering a resident space and before you leave that space, um, and in between residents as well. Now the alcohol-based hand rub needs to be at least 60% alcohol, which all of ours are. Um, so you wanna make sure again that you have enough um, of the hand rub on your hands to cover all surfaces, and you're doing the same exact pr procedure that you would do for your hand washing. Um, now when it comes to the surface decontamination, we wanna make sure that we're using um, the appropriate cleaners. So we have these gold or copper uh, lid wipes. They're the PDI germicidal wipes. And we also have these black top, black top hobby wipes. Um, so you want to make sure when you're using those wipes to disinfect, whether it be um, an object such as like a vital sub machine or um, a surface like a table, that you're following the contact time that's on those um, individual wipes. For the black tops, they are one minute kill time. For the gold tops, they're four minute kill time. We also have a um, spray, a disinfectant spray that's called Lemon Zip. And that is a 10 minute kill time um, before you can wipe that surface. So you just wanna make sure whenever you're using any of those disinfectants that you're following the instructions on the bottle um, and making sure if it says air dry, that you're letting it air dry, that you're not coming um, back with a towel and wiping it down if it um, doesn't indicate that on the directions. Now, as far as um, if you were to have a resident um, or patient that is displaying symptoms of coronavirus or is confirmed for coronavirus, like we said, it would be droplet and contact precautions. So what you would see is a sign that looks like this. It is a lavender pink sign that would be outside the door. So if I'm a nurse and I have someone that I suspect may have coronavirus, I'm going to place this outside the door 
um, even prior to testing. So that way everyone that enters that room is um, familiar with what precautions they need when they enter. This sign was developed by the statewide program for infection control and epidemiology. And this is specific to coronavirus because it does combine droplet and contact. So it will tell you on this sign everything that you need, which I'm going to go through. But you want to make sure again that this is posted um, in a visible spot outside um, on the resident door and also that the supplies that you need would be available outside the room as well. When someone is suspected to have coronavirus, you are going to place a surgical mask on that resident. Um, so that way they um, are also protecting you from coming into contact if they sneeze or if they cough with any droplets. Um, so you're going to place the surgical mask on that resident and you're also going to keep the door shut. Um, so if you're, I'm going into the room, I'm always going to shut the door behind me. If I'm exiting the room, I'm going to shut the door behind me. So what you're going to do when you are going to enter a room is making sure you're using uh, isolation precautions. So this is a surgical gown. And we have two different types of gowns. So this is the standard yellow gown um, that we're all pretty familiar with. We also have a lavender gown that has some sleeves on it, but you're still gonna make sure you're using gloves. So when you're outside the room, you're gonna put your gown on. You're gonna make sure the gown goes all the way around and you're gonna tie it at your waist. And you're also gonna tie it at your neck. If your hair is down, you're gonna make sure it's tied back. Then the next thing you're gonna do is put your mask on. Now, there is a lot of controversy over the masks, such as surgical masks or N95. So if I'm going in um, to do a routine, to just give medications to a resident or to go sit with a resident, do an activity, I'm going to use a surgical mask. If I'm going in to do anything that's considered an aerosol generating procedure, so something that's going to increase the risk of bronchial secretions, such as suctioning or nebulizer treatment, then I'm gonna use an N95 respirator. So these are a one-time use, um, they're up to eight hours, so for, your shift, for the eight-hour shift, um, but if I'm going into a COVID-positive room or someone suspected with COVID, I'm going to use this one time and discard um, following that. So what you're gonna do, after you put your gown on and it's tied, you're next gonna put your mask on and make sure that it loops around your ears or if it's the cone-style mask that it's covering your nose, your mouth, and um, comes right under your chin. Then you're going to make sure it's covering all areas. Then what you're going to do next is use your eyewear and put your eyewear on. These are safety glasses. We also have safety goggles. If you wear glasses routinely, you still need to use either protective face shield or the safety goggles. Um, your glasses are not going to be sufficient. And so these, you want to make sure you put them on and that they're covering on all sides. These are also reusable and can be cleaned with the um, EPA registered those gold top wipes or those copy wipes. And then the last thing you're going to do before you enter the room is put your gloves on. And you want to make sure your gloves are coming over the gown and that they're the right size where they're not going to fall off or be too tight. And then at this point you're ready to enter the room. So, as far as what I have on right now, what is reusable if I'm going into a COVID positive room or someone that's suspected to have COVID, the only thing that is reusable is the eyewear. Um, and so we would have a separate disposable bin for you to put those in so we can clean them. So then I'm gonna enter the room, I'm gonna shut the door. If I'm administering medications or whatever I'm in the room for, I'm gonna make sure that when I'm in the room, the resident also has their surgical mask on um, when I'm interacting with them. Then the last thing you're going to do is when you're all done, you're going to make sure you're near the exit um, by the trash bin. And what you're going to do is you're going to do the opposite as far as taking off. So you're going to start with one glove. You're going to pull from the outer surface and roll it down. So it's in your gloved hand. This is not a clean hand because you want to make sure that you hand wash once you're done taking all your PPE off. So then with your um, other hand, you're going to Go from the inside of the glove, not touching the outside, and roll it down. And then you have your gloves, you're going to discard those. The next thing you're going to do is take your eyewear off, and you're going to take your eyewear off from the sides. So you're going to take off from the sides, put those in the bin that's going to be recleaned and recycled. Then the next thing you're going to do is your gown, so you're going to untie from the neck and untie from the back and you're gonna roll it down so you're not touching any of the contaminated surfaces, which is everything that's on the front 
side of your body. You're going to roll it down into a ball. And so you're rolling away from your body and you're going to discard. And now your mask, you're not going to take off until you leave the room. So you're going to shut the door and right outside the room, you're going to pull from the straps and lift out. So that outside surface of the mask is not coming into contact with your body. Then um, if it's an N95, you're going to pull from the bottom strap first and lift it over your head and then the top strap so that again that mask is not turned over and the outside won't contaminate or come into contact with your skin. Um, some questions we get a lot are the reuse of the N95s um, and right now OSHA and the CDC have said that we can reuse the N95s. Um, so that outside filter is what um, is blocking the respiratory particles from you inhaling those particles or coming into contact. And so there are a few different methods as far as disinfection and one that we will um, be following is the heat disinfection. So placing those in an oven at a low temperature for 30 minutes to disinfect the outside. And then also UV disinfection, um, which we will um, have those instructions out for you once the UV disinfection uh, process starts. They are also, once they are clean, so if I'm taking off an N95, I'm going to put it in a Ziploc bag, not touching the outside surface again when you're taking that off. Then when, um, once it's going to get cleaned, it will come out of a Ziploc bag and be cleaned and then be placed in a brown bag for reuse. Um, they are reused per individual, so if I have an N95 and it's recleaned, it's not going to be given to Brooke after to use. So it's going to have my initials on it and how many times it's been cleaned with a check mark. Great, thank you, Elise. So what I wanna talk about right now is um, what has Orsgate um, been you know, really strategically and operationally planning um, to you know, protect our residents and our team members um, through all the different phases? So as you guys know, really early on when we were low um, risk and we didn't have you know, any, any cases you know, within our county, um, we started taking really proactive you know, measures, like I stated earlier, the restriction of visitation, um, screening our employees before they come on to campus by asking them, you know, asking you guys screening questions um, of, do you have any respiratory symptoms? Have you traveled in the last 14 days? Um, you know, do you work at another location where um, COVID has been confirmed or is expected? Um, and then also getting you know a temperature on, on folks that are as they're coming in. Um, we started looking at um, with our residents, um, you know, not having visitors and really not being in these you know communal settings. What can we do to keep our residents you know engaged and not feel that social isolation that um, that can so easily come you know when we, we are having to maintain you know, that physical space. And on top of that, not having their families come. So we um, started really embracing technology. How can um, we look at FaceTime and Skype and other phone calls to be able to still remain connected to our families? How can we do um, you know, activities with each other when we can't be close with one another? And so in our independent living um, setting, we've had Margarita Mondays, we've done balcony charades, um, you know, in our healthcare areas. We have um, done kind of distant meet and greets for you know new residents that are coming in. Um, but, you know we've really done a lot of you know utilization of our you know courtyard spaces so that we can be outside together but still have an area where we can be you know far apart. Our chaplains have really had to kind of redesign how we are doing our worship services um, and again embracing technology to stream services and do more smaller group settings for, um, for uh, the worship services and that spiritual engagement. So that was a huge you know, component kind of early on. We have tackled all the way to the worst case scenario where kind of best case is having no cases ever to touch the campus and the worst case scenario is what's called a surge where you have you know, multiple positive cases that are cropping up frankly all over campus. And so what does that look like and what thoughts have we put um, behind that? We have been really um, intentional in looking at how would staffing look because that's gonna be a huge component. As residents, if they're getting sick, the likelihood that probably team members are as well. And how does that look? 
Um, some of the things that we have done um, is really started cross training um, folks so that if it's you know all of the um, medication techs that are you know ill at one time could we have you know Randy as our information technology guy to be cross trained to um, you know help out as a companion and do personal care um, could Elise who's the director of nursing who is used to the clinical task can she be cross trained to help out in the kitchen if it's culinary that's you know struggling so doing that really um, kind of cross training with multiple disciplines looking at how it shifts look um, you know for our team members um, if we started dropping you know numbers um, still really being aggressive with our hiring and tapping into the fact that um, while it's so unfortunate you know for our economy that um, folks are being laid off you know in the restaurant industry and in the hospitality industry frankly even at hospitals um, folks are being laid off because all of those elective surgeries um, are just not happening and so really um, tapping into that market to bring people on board here at Aldersgate um, so that we have you know a good pool of um, you know team members what do we do to take care of you guys so that if if we do have that surge that happens on campus um, and frankly maybe you're not comfortable to go home because you have been you know intimately caring for someone who's COVID positive with the right PPE on um, it makes your risk you know a very low that you're going to um, catch COVID but maybe frankly you're just uncomfortable with going home because you have small children um, we have prepared cottages here on our campus so that you could stay here if you want to um, and sleep. It's not saying that's a requirement, but that, that, that is an option. Providing you guys already and now today with you know free meals on the days that you work. We've had food trucks that have come um, to um, help you know really just celebrate you guys um, as you know just heroes that are working you know in, in this industry. And guys, that goes for all disciplines or, or heroes. I know that on a lot of um, you know, media that you're seeing that it's, you know, the nurse and the doctors, and I'm a nurse, <laughs> so I, I get it. But really, the they're, hospitals. you know, they're showing exactly that it's that hospital nurse or that hospital physician. Guys, that is not the case because we are seeing across the nation, and you guys every single day are coming in and caring for our elders. Um, and during this, this, frankly, this war that we're fighting, and you guys are the heroes, and that's culinary, who's preparing the nutrition to keep our folks healthy. That's housekeeping. Oh, y'all have such a huge piece of this and keeping, you know, our environment, um, you know, decontaminated and that cleaning, it's huge. It's the chaplains that are providing that support when we lose residents, not necessarily to COVID, but we're losing residents who um, may not be able to have their family, you know, right here beside them. Um, so it's, it's all those team members um, that are just exceptional heroes and looking at ways that we can support you guys if we do start to see, you know, an uptick in deaths. Maybe COVID does come onto our campus and we're starting to lose a lot of residents that we've cared for for a long time. How does that support look for you guys? Um, We've looked at, you know, kind of engagement across the board. We've sat down with our medical director to see, you know, how are we going to care for um, residents if it's in one level of care or frankly, if it's across the entire community, how does that look? Um, and so it can look a couple of uh, different ways. I know a lot of times we think when someone, um, you know, is, is sick that, that the place they need to be on campus is at Asbury you know, our highest level of care. And that, that may not always be the case um, with COVID. Um, a lot of times residents that we're finding um, with our peers and our sister communities is that if someone in independent living is diagnosed with COVID or shown respiratory symptoms, that does not necessarily mean they need to come to Asbury. They may be able to stay in their home and get the support services that they need without ever having to come to Asbury. So um, let's talk real quick about how it can look across the different um, kind of levels of care. So in independent living, if someone started to show um, respiratory symptoms, or let's say worst case scenario, they are confirmed as COVID positive, how would that look? 
So if they are for the most part clinically stable and they are not requiring, you know, round the clock nursing care that Asbury can provide, they can stay in their residence under isolation. Now, if they are in an independent living, they would not necessarily have this sign that's going to be on their door. There would be a dignity sign that's going to be very similar to this, but is going to let um, team members that may need to come into those spaces um, aware that this person um, is showing respiratory-like symptoms or maybe COVID positive so that you would know the necessary precautions to take for that person. So they may be able to stay in their home under isolation. How long, people have asked. According to the CDC and what's best practice is, once someone starts showing symptoms of coronavirus or is confirmed, from the day their symptoms first appear, there needs to be at least seven days that have lapsed. And within that seven days, there also needs to be three consecutive days where they have not had a fever. And they have to not have a fever without the use of any medications to bring the fever down, like Tylenol, like ibuprofen, like aspirin. So that would be when someone in independent living could then kind of come out of their isolation in their home and um, you know would be kind of acclimated back into the general population. Still wearing a surgical mask. Still wearing a surgical mask. So. Um, and that everybody wearing a cloth facial covering or a surgical mask did go into effect and this is for all levels of care and for all team members to at the least wear a cloth facial covering. That came about um, a little over a week ago um, as a recommendation for anybody that's working at a healthcare facility. Now, cloth facial coverings are ideal for those that are working in culinary um, who may not have that, you know, really direct to resident contact. Um, the surgical mask that Elise showed earlier, that is typically more reserved for the people that are doing the hands-on clinical care or that are going to be in close proximity um, with our residents. So if, when you come through the Welcome Center, um, you may have gotten a facial, um, a cloth facial covering. You get this one time and you can wash it daily and re-wear it. If you are clinical in nature, CNA, our nurses, our med techs, our medication aides, um, our you know, social workers, dietitians, our culinary workers that are going into resident spaces, um, and, you know, particularly at Asbury or Parker Harris or Cuthbertson, that is the type of um, facial mask that you would wear. And that goes across the board. So that would be um, kind of what independent living would look like and when a resident could come out of isolation at that time. Assisted living. What would it look like if someone started showing respiratory symptoms in assisted living? And it's gonna look a little different depending on if they're in Parker Terrace or if they're in Cuthbertson. At Parker Terrace, if someone started to show symptoms, the likelihood that they can isolate in their room is gonna be pretty high. You would see a sign like this on the door and you would initiate all those precautions that Elise talked about earlier and they would be able to stay in their space because they would be able to cognitively um, understand what isolation entails and that they can't come out of their room and um, they would need to wear you know, a facial mask when you know, the caregiver's in. Now at Cuthbertson Village, which is our memory support unit where everyone has that's um, a resident there has a diagnosis of dementia, um, the likelihood that they would be able to follow isolation precautions is gonna be um, very slim that they would be able to do that. So um, kind of our mindset is if one person in Cuthbertson um, is COVID positive or shows respiratory symptoms, we are assuming the entire household is going to be under those same precautions. So we would lock down that individual household and that would kind of at that time be a, a COVID area. Again, you would know that because you would have the sign up um, before you even enter into the space and it would be dedicated team members that would be coming in and out of that space. Um, so that's what it would look, you know, in the assisted living setting. Now for Asbury, how would that look, our highest level of care? Per the recommendation kind of early on from the Centers for Disease Control and the Department of Health and Human Services, they wanted us to start really clearing out one location that could be dedicated to COVID positive um, individuals if we needed it. We started clearing out the Midwood household and kind of strategically moving residents to other locations. And as they discharged back into the community, 
we were able to free up the Midwood household to be our kind of what we have termed our cohort household. What we're using the Midwood household for is let's go back to that independent living resident who may start showing respiratory symptoms or becomes COVID positive, which we hope doesn't happen, but maybe they're not able to be maintained in their residence because they're just having severe shortness of breath. They need more routine nursing monitoring. They would come into that Midwood household. Now, one of the common questions that we have been getting from um, a lot of our employees and fr family members, frankly, is at Aldersgate, are you guys going to knowingly take a COVID positive case um, from the outside community? I will tell you at this point in time, the answer to that is no, we are not actively taking COVID positive people that are at the hospital and bringing them into the Aldersgate community. Now, Watch this carefully because what could happen is that same independent living resident that I told you about or that assisted living resident or maybe a resident at Asbury, if they um, start to show um, you know, respiratory symptoms and they are COVID positive, they may already be in the community and therefore would be a COVID positive in the community. Or on the flip side, a perfectly um, a relatively healthy individual may, let's say, have a fall and they fracture their hip and it requires them to go out to the hospital and then they've been exposed potentially to COVID and maybe they test positive. Aldersgate is their home, so they would be able to come back to their home and that might be a situation where we do admit someone back into the community that's COVID positive. The last scenario with this, and we have seen this happening, in um, really hard hit states like New York and Louisiana and Washington is that in some places where the number of COVID positive cases has been so overwhelming, the government has actually been mandating facilities to take COVID positive. And that uh, we again hope that it does not get to that level here in Mecklenburg County, but again, Aldersgate is prepared if it does come to that level. And so in that situation, we have seen um, some of our um, peers in um, other states that have had to do one of two things. One, clean out um, you know, some of their locations to make room to, so all the healthy individuals are going to another facility to make room for COVID spaces. And that's to help alleviate the burden that the hospitals are seeing where they physically can't take care of that many people. So that is one scenario. Or on the flip side, the other scenario is that um, all the well people from other communities are moving into potentially our space and there would be um, our COVID folks would go to another location. So there's a lot of different scenarios that can play out in time. We don't have a crystal ball to know what that's gonna look like, um, but that, those could be scenarios where um, COVID could enter into our community um, and it's not, you know, in an intentional move with COVID coming, that's just something that could happen. Um, also, we have been very intentional here at Aldersgate that we do not want people to lose their jobs. Um, we see the devastation that is happening, you know, uh, throughout the United States with the unemployment being the highest it has, you know, been in years. Um, the stock market and the economy taking, you know, the hardest hits that we've seen since, you know, the Great Depression and really in 2008 when the stock market tanked, we're seeing it to that level. And so that is why we are doing things here at Aldersgate, like cross-training folks, to be able to use people in spaces um, that they may not normally um, work in. And in doing that and to be able to operate Aldersgate, we have to have revenue that's coming in. And so we have to continue taking admissions because Aldersgate is a huge chunk of our revenue that frankly pays for everybody's salaries. So when you see admissions still coming in, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Yes, it does expose us to some level of risk to this virus, but we also have to look at the financial risk of not taking um, admissions altogether. And that would be a huge chunk of our revenue which would mean a huge chunk that we would take a hit to that contributes to paying all of our salaries. So um, just wanted to you know, put that out there as far as taking COVID positive cases. Um, 
Another question that we have been getting a lot is, what can I do to protect my family when I go home? Um, so a lot of fear around, you know, I may have been taking care of someone that's COVID positive um, or somebody with respiratory symptoms that we suspect is COVID positive. What can I do to protect myself and my family when I go home? Do you want to take the police yeah. and talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, as Brooke shared earlier, if you're wearing the appropriate PPE and in, in taking care of someone that may be suspected to have coronavirus or confirmed coronavirus, you are considered a low risk by the CDC. If you have no PPE on and you're greater than six feet away from someone with coronavirus, you're also considered a low risk for um, transmission. Now, with that, you still want to make sure that, um, of course, when you're going home, that you're following appropriate procedures, so you're washing your hands before you leave for the day. Um, what some folks may do is have a change of scrubs or clothes so that they change. Um, prior to leaving work on their way home, but you also want to make sure that before you go in your house um, that you're taking off your clothing, whether it be in your garage or just having a separate um, clean pair of clothes to change into and throwing those clothes into the washing machine. Um, and just on um, standard setting, making sure that there's at least warm water or hot water to disinfect with detergent um, on your clothing. But again, as long as you have that appropriate PPE on, you are considered a low risk. Now, um, you're actually considered a higher risk going to the grocery store um, where you, you really don't know what's out there. You don't know how um, they're disinfecting their surfaces or their cash register or any of that. So you really want to make sure um, that you're hand washing as much as possible when you get home that you're hand washing before you are um, going to eat meals or anything like that that you're hand washing. Um, that is the number one way to prevent the spread of the infection. Thank you, Elise. Um, another question that we've gotten um, that was a, kind of a common question is, what should I wear while at work to protect our, myself and our residents? What should I also wear when I'm at home or out in public to protect myself? So again, we talked about how when you come through the Welcome Center um, at Shamrock um, on the days that you're working, um, a lot of you have been issued a facial um, covering, this cloth covering. One time you get issued this and it can be washed daily. And this was reserved for really, you know, maybe the culinary worker that's in independent living. If you're working in marketing, really kind of those um, non-direct um, patient or resident contact areas that you can wear this. Um, if I am at my individual work area, yes, I can pull my facial covering down. I don't have to wear it all the time. If I'm in culinary and I'm actively preparing food, um, you do not have to wear a facial covering. Still follow the same recommendations that the FDA puts in place for safe food handling, um, you wanna still follow those. However, if I come out and I am now in close proximity with one of my coworkers, I absolutely wanna make sure that I have on um, a facial covering um, to lessen the risk of exposure um, to my team members. Um, in the clinical areas, everybody is wearing a surgical mask at this time. Um, there is not a need for an N95 um, mask unless there is someone that is confirmed COVID positive or showing respiratory symptoms. The N95 mask, actually, you would wear this type of mask for the majority of the interactions that a nurse, a CNA, culinary, housekeeping, social workers, dietitians, anyone coming into that space would still wear a surgical mask in a COVID room. The only time you would wear the N95 mask is if you were doing things that would produce aerosol producing particles. And that is typically if I'm suctioning somebody, if I'm doing a nebulizer treatment, if and we don't do this here, but if I am you know, intubating someone, those are the type of um, activities or tasks that someone may be doing that would um, warrant someone wearing an N95 um, mask. So um, wearing that on a day-to-day -day basis is, is not recommended. Um, you want to utilize that for when there is a confirmed COVID positive um, case. So um, we have actually put out several documents, Elise and I have, and you can get those from your manager that will walk through your department and different scenarios that you may encounter and what PPE would you need um, if someone is, has respiratory symptoms, maybe they're perfectly healthy, or maybe they're COVID positive, what do you need to do to protect yourself when we have those documents? Elise also put together a very nice disinfecting um, a, a document that'll show you um, how to disinfect certain PPE that can be reused. And then another document we have is talking about kind of isolation timeframes. How long if someone's COVID positive do they need to stay 
um, in their, their space. Um, if I am, you know, showing symptoms of, you know, respiratory illness, how long do I need to, you know, stay out of work for? Human Resources has also put together a frequently asked question document that you can obtain from your manager as well that goes over certain things such as, um, I'm out for respiratory symptoms. Do I have to use my top time? Um, so a lot of answers to those questions that you can find on those frequently asked questions. Um, as far as what do you need to wear when you're at home, again, maintaining that social distance from your loved ones is um, still recommended even when you're in the home setting. Um, if you're going out to the supermarket or to another store, that is where the risk is going to be the highest for you guys. It is not going to be here at Aldersgate. It's going to be out in the stores that's a far less controlled environment than here. And again, the cloth facial covering is recommended so that, and, and this is frankly guys, this is not going to protect um, you from getting it from someone. This is frankly protecting others. Um, if you have some, then people get very um, kind of disillusioned and think that wearing any type of facial covering is protecting me if I have it on. That is not the case. These are protecting other people if I am what we call an asymptomatic carrier. So don't think that masks are protecting you, even the N95s, even the cloth facial coverings. What is going to protect you during this time the best is washing your hands and socially distancing. That is why the government the CDC, the World Health Organization, that's why they preach that the most, okay? Um, how are new admissions handled at the different levels of care? We've kind of talked about that. If someone is healthy that is moving in from the outside community into independent living, we are asking that they stay in their residence for 14 days. You do not need any personal protective equipment for those folks because frankly, they're healthy. You don't start personal protective equipment until people start to show symptoms. You will already have your facial covering um, in place, which is really, even if they were COVID positive, there's not much more when it comes to PPE that you would be utilizing anyways. So those new admissions coming, they would need to stay in their residence for 14 days. What about new admissions that are coming into Parker Terrace or into Asbury? Parker Terrace, again, they would self-isolate into their, their room. And again, PPE would not be needed unless they start to show symptoms. New admissions from the hospital that are coming to Asbury would come back through that Midwood household. Do you need PPE for those folks coming from the hospital into Asbury? We have had multiple conversations with the Centers for Disease Control and the Department of Health and Human Services. The answer is no. You would still just need your surgical mask to care for these folks and use your standard precautions. If they start to show um, respiratory symptoms, then you would initiate um, the further um, kind of COVID precautions and put those into place. When can they come out of their spaces? Remember, if they're showing no respiratory symptoms, cohort them for 14 days, and then they can come into the general population. Once they start to show symptoms, it's that seven days from the start of symptoms with three days being fever free, okay? So I know that's a lot of information to throw at folks, but there is frankly a lot of information that comes with COVID. If um, we did not answer a question that you may have, um, you know, kind of formulating in your head, we have designed an email um, portal that you can submit questions to. That portal is called COVID19Questions at aldersgateccrc.com. So that's COVID, C-O-V-I-D, the number one, the number nine, questions with an S at the end, at aldersgateccrc.com. So please submit us questions um, as you have them. If you have concerns or thoughts, please do not hesitate to reach out to Suzanne Pew, our CEO, Jeff Weatherhead, our COO, Elise Piscitelli, who is really the clinical voice for COVID-19. You can reach out to her, or please reach out to me as the Director of Health Services, Brooke Hodge. Um, thank you so much for your time. We are so grateful for all of the workers here. Our elders need you in this war because this is what it is, is a war, guys. We don't know when the enemy is coming or if it is going to come, but our elders need you guys now more than ever because we are seeing that them getting good care in the hospital is just not happening. 
They are really ushering our elders out to make space for healthy, younger individuals who need the respirators, and that's such a disservice to our elders. And we know here at Aldersgate, because of you guys, they're gonna get good care, and that's why we need you guys so much, okay? Thanks so much for joining us for today, and we will see you soon. Bye-bye.